Uh, hi. Hi. How you doing? Good. Okay. I'm Dr. George Bottomley. I'm the director, it's me, DBMPC, director of the Center for Physician Assistant Studies and a professor in the center. I'm a native Rhode Islander who started the program about five or six years ago, and, and here we are today. So thank you for coming. This is our, my goodness, how many open houses have we had? A number. A number, <laughs> a number, a number of open houses. And we're being filmed today, um, just so you know. Um, and it's editable, but I'll try to be brief and succinct and say what's on my mind. Um, but the first thing I want to do is introduce the team. The, it takes a village to run this place and to, to educate our students. Um, so PA programs generally are sort of split between a didactic team, which handles really the first year stuff, and a clinical team, which handles the second year stuff, the clinical year stuff. Why don't we start with the didactic, didactic year team? Sure. Yep. Hi, um, my name is Ashley Hughes. I'm on the didactic team. I am an assistant professor and academic coordinator. Where'd you go to school? Oh, went to school at Northeastern. <laughs> and where'd you practice a specialty? <laughs> More questions. Yes, yes. That's so it. I initially went to undergrad and studied forensic science, biochemistry, moved on to, from there to PA studies at Northeastern, and worked in emergency medicine and still do, and I work in Boston at Brigham and Women's Hospital. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Vicki Miller. I'm also on the didactic side of the house. Um, I've been a PA for 30 years. My undergraduate was a uh, Bio, yes, in biochemistry, microbiology, and medical technology. And then I went to Yale, um, did the PA program at Yale 31 years ago. My clinical specialty is cardiac surgery and critical care. I've been a chief PA um, for about 25 years now, a clinical preceptor for almost all of my 30 years. But the hardest and most rewarding job has been um, being full time faculty here. Uh, my name is Alec Kamboris. I'm the newest member of the didactic team. I just joined in May. I relocated from Washington, D.C., where I practiced for about 10 years, mostly in neurosurgery, some critical care, and outpatient general surgery. Um, undergrad was complicated. Uh, <laughs> I did too many things, I think. Uh, biology, health sciences, and a certificate in nuclear medicine. So uh, being a PA was a second career for me. Um, Happy to be here and uh, welcome, guys. Welcome, team. Who want me to start? Uh, hey, guys. I'm Craig. Craig Bailey. I'm one of the PAs. Uh, went to Mass College of Pharmacy in Boston about 10 years ago. Been predominantly working in emergency medicine. Did a three-year stint in liver, kidney, pancreas transplant in California. Spent a year in Alaska, which was interesting. Uh, joined the team pretty recently, but hit the ground running. And, Love it. Good to see you guys. Thanks for coming. My name is Kelly Cruzel. I'm actually originally from Buffalo, New York. Uh, that's where I did my undergrad and graduate degree. I went to Geneva College. Um, I worked in emergency medicine there. Uh, relocated here about two years ago to work in this program, and I've been working at an urgent care ever since. Good afternoon. My name is Mallory Sullivan. I'm also part of the clinical team. I went to Mass College of Pharmacy for PA school, and I also work in emergency medicine here in Providence. Great. The rest of our staff, Liz, come on and say yes. hello. Who are you? Uh, Liz Roach, I just started yesterday, so I'm brand new. <laughs> yeah. I'm very excited to be here, and I'm going to support the clinical team. And Maureen's hiding. Yep. Yeah. Hiding. We'll bring her out later. She's mm -hmm. the chief of staff holds the team together. Um, Come on, in. Come on in. So we're going to do a brief presentation, talk a little bit about the PA profession, some numbers and things. Katie's going to talk. We're going to the, the teams are going to talk about their clinical and didactic year curricula. Um, Katie's going to talk a little bit more specifically about admissions process, and then we're going to bring about 20 students. My goodness, we've got a bunch of students who are going to come in and answer questions for you and, and give you a tour. <coughs> so. Let's get started. Feel free to ask any questions along the way, I think. Are we all set? Okay. So this is our first class of 24 students who graduated from the PA program. This is where we have graduation ceremonies. We used to have graduation ceremonies in the 
Providence Performing Arts Center, so you can see it's not the stairway leading up to the second floor here. Um, and graduated a bunch of classes now, just graduated the class of 2018, 36 students. And we're very proud, um, over half of each class has stayed in the state of Rhode Island to practice, even though really not that many are originally from Rhode Island. Um, so the clinical year is paying off for them. Um, our preceptors in the health care systems and the hospitals in Rhode Island are loving our students. They're smart and they're kind. That's about the best we can get, I think, for graduates. That, that's, really, that, that's what we're looking for in, in, in the student when they come in and, and when they go out. So they're out and a number of them have come back to the program and are teaching and helping out in clinical skills labs and stuff. So, so that's, that's the end goal there. Um, Oops. Yeah, I think you need to do that. There we go. A little bit about Johnson and Wales. Um, we're over 100 years old. We were actually started by two women. Um, where's Katie? She knows their names. Gertrude and Gertrude Johnson and Mary Wales. There we go. I always ask Katie. Um, we started as a business school, and over the years, we've developed a number of campuses. We have two campuses in Providence. One down in the harbor, our Harborside campus with a big gym and athletic fields and sort of a traditional campus. Um, dormitories, this is our down city campus. We own a lot of downtown Providence. We have an equine center in Rehoboth as well, so we actually have three campuses in Rhode Island. We have a campus in Charlotte, North Carolina, North Miami, and Denver as well. So we've got about 15,000 students around the country. Um, College, the Center and the Physician Assistant Studies Program are one of um, several programs in the graduate section of the College of Health and Wellness, the PA program, and we've got a couple of um, post-professional and a doctoral level occupational therapy program that, that, are, that are just coming out of the gate now as well. We have undergraduate programs in health science, public health, nutrition and applied dietetics, and we're really expanding our, our background in um, as a cooking school in the area of culinary nutrition, and we're 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 sort of making a an imprint in that food is medicine area. Um, we've got a long history of working with Tulane medical students and now Brown medical students, and Mallory will talk a little bit later about our PA students, how they have classes in how to select and prepare and cook foods that are appropriate for people with certain medical medical issues. We really are trying to emphasize that food is medicine, um, because it is. So what is a PA? Uh, what do you need to do to become a PA? You need to graduate from an accredited program such as us. We have, we have an accreditation status. And you need to become uh, certified by taking a national certification exam, the physician assistant <coughs> national certification exam. And then you need to um, apply in every state that you want to practice in, um, apply for a license. Um, while there's discussion at the national level about us moving to a more autonomous practice model, at this point we have delegated autonomy. We work with our supervising physician, I like to call them our collaborating physician, to work in a partnership with him or her um, to share the same scope of practice that that, that, that person has. For, any information you want to have on physician assistants, what our scope of practice is. Um, this is sort of the mothership of, 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 of websites to go to, aapa.org. And the AAPA link um, is, is where you can go to access all these other websites, but if you're interested in PA education and you want to learn more about the national certification exam, that's the NCCPA, NCCPA. PA.net is the, is the place to go to for that. Um, and when you want to get a job, you go back to the AAPA website. Um, so everything really is accessible to that, to that AAPA website. Um, growth of the profession. Um, we were, our first graduates were in 1967, I think, from Duke. A number of, um, so the, the profession is relatively new. First class was several people who were paramedics in, in the Vietnam War. So since 1967, we have really grown to, not 2017, this is data from the NCCPA website that I just mentioned. 
123,000 nationally certified PAs, about 500 are practicing abroad now. Today. Um, these are some of the numbers of certified, P certified PAs in the, different, in the different states. And the Bureau of Labor Statistics, I just reviewed this data today, 37% growth rate from 2016 to 2026. So I think one reason a lot of you are in the room today is because of the, the job growth that we all anticipate in this in this industry. Um, and again, from that from that NCCPA report, the PA workforce is largely young and and mostly women. Um, six almost seventy percent of all the PAs in the country are, are practicing PAs in the country are, are women. Um, fairly young, over half of all certified PAs are under forty. The new PA programs that have really started to develop, like us. Are, are graduating a number of younger people and where the PA profession used to be largely male and a little bit older, second career people such as myself, it's really, it's really making a shift. Um, PAs in primary care are, are unfortunately decreasing. We, we'll look at a little bit more of that um, information in a minute. But something to be aware of is that in 2016, the educational debt the average educational debt from being in PA school was $112,000. So I'll talk a little bit more about the realities of the school that you go to and what their tuition and fees are relative to the kind of job you may get later and, 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 and a few other things. I won't steal my own thunder. Um, more information from that NCCPA report that I thought might be interesting. 26.7% of, of the of the of folks are in primary care. That's going down a little bit every year. Fewer and fewer people are staying in primary care, and I'll show you the reason why in a minute. I think um, surgical subspecialties are growing: orthopedics, cardiothoracic surgery, and neurosurgery. Um, that's the number two um, most popular uh, subspecialty in, of, of people who are working. Emergency medicine is three, and an internal medicine subspecialty is fourth. So that's where most of the PAs are practicing these days. Salaries, something you are interested in probably. The national, national need of all practicing PAs um, in the 2070 course, about $107,000. So that's for everybody who's gone out and started to practice, from the newbies to the people who've been out practicing for, for 30 or 40 years. But there's a huge range in there. The highest special specialties are dermatology, dermatology, and some of the surgery specialties. Pathology is another huge subspecialty, um, and the reason that a lot of people go into want into PA medicine is to become a family medicine PA or a pediatrician or work in some sort of a primary care area. But you can see when you graduate with $112,000 worth of debt you may be more motivated to go into some of the higher paying specialties rather than the lower ones that really kind of were your initial reason for going into <coughs> to PA education. So one thing you really need to look at is the tuition and the fees that the PA program that you finally choose to go to will, um, will leave you with. We're around $96,000 I think for two years of the program. Um, it's on our website. Um, we're at, we're at, the, at the top of the lowest third of the PA programs in the country. There are PA programs that are less expensive than us. When you graduate and have student debt, it's sort of a mortgage payment. So look around for a program that can meet your requirements, but also look at the price tag because, because you don't want to end up in a specialty that you may not want to practice in um, because of your debt burden. So it's a really, really important thing to consider um, when you're making these kinds of decisions. Okay, I'll shut up about that. Let's talk about the center, Center for Physician Assistant Studies. We're in the <clears throat> part of the, the old, I'm a native Rhode Islander, I grew up in Rhode Island, um, and we used to know this as the jewelry district in Rhode Island. Now it's called the knowledge district because Brown Medical School is down the street Johnson & Wales has expanded over into this area. We purchased this building about six years ago. This was a jewelry manufacturing building, the Clayton Manufacturing Building. We bought it, pretty much gutted it, and turned it, turned it into this. I think we're unique in the country 
only a few PA programs in the country have their entire facility devoted to their PA students. So our students have 24-7 access to this building. No other students at the university come here to study. Um, and it sort of is one of the things that we like about the building and it really fits with our mission statement. Physician Assistant Study Programs educate students to become collaborative practitioners of the respect, empathy, and trust inherited in patient-centered humanistic care. So I think the big things are a, an esprit de corps that I think we have in the program and a collaborative spirit that I think is established by just having PA students in this building. They really develop close interpersonal relationships when they're helping other studies, helping others study, studying in small groups. You can see how the architecture was was intentional in, in kind of creating that collaborative spirit in the building. Um, the humanistic piece is something that I thought was important enough to just put right in the mission statement and um, the, the icon of humanistic patient care in this country is the Arnold P. Gold Foundation out of Columbia University in New York City. If you want to find out a little bit more about humanistic medicine and, and what it means and how it actually improves patient outcomes, improves the longevity of faculty, and improves the longe longevity of pe people uh, who are practicing to be PAs. If, if you keep the heart in healthcare, I think it works for, it works for everybody quite, quite well. So what makes us special? This is, you're here to learn about us today and to see if what you're looking for fits with what we have to offer, because it's really all about fit. There are 200 and some programs in the country, so there should be one out there that really, that really fits for you. I talked a little bit about the center. We've gotten all kinds of awards. We're a lead gold building and a preservation society province gave the state an award. Um, we are an affiliate of the, of the medical, Brown Medical School right down the street. Um, one of their um, vice associate deans is on our advisory board. And I'd say the vast majority of people who aren't our own faculty who, and who come in and teach in the program, about 40% of the lecturing in the program is done by outside folks, are Brown, uh, are Brown affiliates. We use their clinical skills lab down there and their standardized patient program. Um, to help us evaluate our students at different points during the program. They've been very friendly, very warm, very, very, very welcoming to us. I serve on their medical school curriculum committee. Um, it's, been, it's been wonderful working with them. I think our emphasis on humanistic principles is, is, is unique to us. We find that, we're very proud of that. You, the faculty have given you a brief introduction. They've, they're all still in clinical practice, so they bring that relevancy to the classroom. Um, one of my philosophies is not to have somebody up here lecturing to our students who don't have experience in what they're lecturing on. So um, that's something that makes us a little bit different as well. Our adjunct lecturers, same, same for them. 99% first time pass rate, and I think our curriculum is is unique as well. Um, I think we've developed a good 24-month program. I had a 24-month um, program when I was at Yale. Um, uh, Professor Miller and I both went to Yale. Um, 24 months, I directed the Yale program for a while in my past, and we do it quite well in 24 months here. We have a strong foundation in the basic medical sciences. I think if you have a strong understanding of normal physiology and anatomy, it's going to be easier for you to understand abnormal physiology and anatomy, which is disease. Um, the team will talk a little bit about more, the, a little bit more about the integrated body system approach. But we really intentionally put the program together to give you the fundamentals and the basics in early in the program, and then with increasing difficulty through the didactic year to prepare you for the clinical year, we ask you to apply and synthesize those facts to cases in a more complex nature through the program. So we've put a lot of thought into the development of the program and how we present you with material and how we ask you to use it and metabolize it as you, as you, work, through, as you work through cases. Um, the clinical team will talk a little bit about specialty tracks as well. Our medical director just walked in. Dr. Sidlaki, hello. Hi. How are you? Good. <laughs> we'll, 
talk more later. So here's the curriculum. I'm going to turn it over to the didactic team to talk a little bit about the first year of the program. Okay. Um, so in our first year, we have it separated out into three semesters, the summer, fall, and spring semesters. I'll talk a little bit about the summer, and Professor Miller will talk about the fall and the spring. So you really hit the ground running from day one. So day one in the program, you have um, you have to come in prepared knowing medical terminology, you have to know basic anatomy, and we hope that that foundation is pretty solid because once you start, you are going right into anatomy lectures and anatomy labs. You're learning the gross anatomy, and you're taking what you learn in anatomy lab and you're applying it to another course. So you apply it to patient care. And in patient care one, that is what we really call the bread and butter of being a PA. So that's where you learn how to do, take a um, patient interview, assess the patient, perform a physical examination, and get those basics down so that you can develop upon that as you move into the fall and the spring. We also have a course called Foundations of Medicine so that we make sure that everyone has a very solid basic science foundation, again, before heading into the fall. And it's so that you understand um, the physiology behind disease. So Foundations of Medicine includes genetics, immunology, microbiology, cell physiology, and also introduction to pharmacology. And it's again, just to make sure that everyone is on the same page as you move forward from that spring, that summer semester into the fall and the spring. And Professor Kimorris can talk about PHP, which is another course that runs alongside those courses. Uh, professional Health Policy is a course that spans uh, three semesters in the didactic year. And in this course, uh, you know, some people call it the touchy-feely course, but it's really not. We talk about issues that face uh, a profession um, healthcare in the United States is very complex and changing all the time. Uh, we talk about medical ethics uh, topics. Uh, we talk about professionalism, as the title states, and issues that arise, um, whether that is you know within your own profession, within other professions. Um, we talk about collaboration within professions and um, the history of the PA profession, where we are, where we, where we come from, where we are now, and where we can potentially go. Um, and then whatever students really want to talk about, they incorporate that in, and then evidence-based evidence medicine. So I love this curriculum. Um, I've been teaching a long time. I'm one of the elders in the program. And when we went through PA school, um, <clears throat> they were just parallel courses. So when we were doing anatomy, um, Dr. Bottomley brought, one of my favorite things about this program is in our anatomy lab. We have our own cadavers right here in the building. And we learned that at Yale, um, and it really stuck with us. And so <clears throat> not only do we use the anatomy lab all year long, you start your summer in the anatomy lab really working as anatomists, really learning the anatomic basis of medicine. And then we're going to carry it forward into the fall when we go back into the lab this time as pathologists looking for evidence of disease in our cadavers. We really find it. And it's amazing now what you're learning in the module. You go back up and you say, oh, this guy has cardiomegaly. This guy had a bypass. Oh, here's pacemaker. Oh, look, there's diverticulitis. Because then in spring, we go back into the lab again, this time as proceduralists. And we actually take out the gallbladder. We put chest tubes in. We do all sorts of procedures. We really value, we're very grateful, very humbled for the tremendous gift having our cadaver lab right here in our own building. <coughs> Excuse me. So the way the curriculum works going fall to spring, what I like so much about it is that in medicine, we finally figured out that instead of having parallel paths where radiology did one thing and pathology did another thing and internal medicine was over here and surgery was over there, we said let's put the patient in the middle of this wheel and let's work around the patient, patient-centered patient care. And we did it a lot better then. Well, that's what this program does. It puts the student at the center, and we work around the student. So instead of studying anatomy, you know, we were studying the abdomen, and in pharmacology, we were learning about high blood pressure meds, and in pathophysiology, we were learning about arthritis. You know, it was, there was just no crossover. Those courses just went along on their parallel pathways. Here, the concept of module, starting head to toe in the fall, I'm going to use cardiology for the example, is that we have four courses that run throughout the year. So as you look, these courses run clinical medicine, pharmacotherapeutics, diagnostic skills, patient care, and then Dr. Kim Boris's course, the PHP course, they run all year. 
But when we're in the cardiology module, bisecting down, we do clinical medicine just about the cardiology system, hypertension, heart failure, MI, anything having to do with the heart. At the same time, we're learning pharmacotherapeutics. What drugs do you use for hypertension? How do you treat heart failure? How do you manage? What, what do we do with ischemic patients? Well, diagnostic skills. You learn how to do an EKG, read an EKG, go to the cath lab, do a stress test, interpret an echo. At the same time, we're doing patient care. So now we build on the basics of a history and physical, and we start doing specialty tests. The physical exam of the patient with a cardiac complaint or concern. And then our PHP is the guidelines. What are the evidence-based medicine criteria for treating hypertension? Do I use drug A or drug B? Well, there's evidence to tell us why we should pick drug A. So the whole module revolves around the student. And I think that's what we've accomplished. It's unique. It's Dr. Bottom Lee's vision. And you know, when I decided I wanted to become full-time faculty, I had a lot of choices. And I chose this program because I saw that same pattern in medicine. We got it. Put the patient at the center of the world, and let's work around the patient. Well, we're doing that in an educational form here. We put the student at the center of the universe, and we work around the student. It's hard on faculty because we have to integrate things. And when you take an exam, you just take, say, the cardiology exam. But within that exam, there are questions that are pharmacotherapeutics, or diagnostic skills, or patient care, or the disease itself, all in one exam, just like the NCC boards. So you are taking fully based electronic exams the whole time you're here. You take, I think, over 50 exams in your first year, <laughs> just on Fridays. But boy, that's why we have such a good pass rate, because we're teaching you not only to be good providers, but good test takers. It's a necessity of the profession, unfortunately. We have to recertify every 10 years. But um, Dr. Bottomley has served on the committee that writes questions for the boards. I serve on the committee that writes questions for specialty certification in cardiovascular diseases. So the quality of our questions, the whole curriculum is electronically based. You get all the PowerPoints in advance. The lectures are recorded. Everything looks like this. You have it to go back to and re-listen to. And the exam questions are on laptops that are locked down through a system. So you become very proficient at gaining competencies and our ability to assess you. And the other thing that we do are OSCEs. Professor Hughes, would you like me to touch on that, or should we just, that's what Dr. Bottomley was alluding to with our professionals. We actually take you through, we put you in with a professional patient, you're videotaped, and then you have feedback. How did you take that history and that physical, and you wrote an electronic medical note, so you get used to electronic medical record systems, how to write a note, how to document, how to write the prescription, and how to verbally present that patient to the attending or the physician, the team that you're working with. So it's a beautifully designed curriculum, and I'm, I'm very happy to be here. It's really outstanding. So one other thing that we do during the didactic year that Dr. Bottomley touched upon is our food and medicine course, which is my favorite part of the program. Because <laughs> um, I like to cook and more so like to eat. But what we do is go down to Harborside campus where they have the industrial um, culinary kitchens. So we work alongside the culinary students and the chefs that are down there. Um, so something that's very important to us here um, is, you know, teaching that food is medicine and there's more to just pills in a bottle. There's other things that we can teach our patients to do um, in their lives to help make themselves and their families more helpful. Um, so what we try to do along with kind of staying um, within our modules is again tying that into the modules as well. So for example, we're in the cardiac module, we talk about heart healthy eating or diets for um, patients with high blood pressure and keeping in mind different ethnic backgrounds, different income levels. Um, we come up with menus and recipes that we can share with our patients um, to help make small changes in their lives that can really uh, be quite impactful for them and their families um, with keeping in mind that everyone can't go to Whole Foods every night and spend $100 on groceries. So um, it's something that I think is really fun and, and our students really enjoy and a chance to work alongside the culinary students and take advantage of our um, culinary program that we have here at Johnson & Wales. Um, so after all of this, you have a very lengthy two-week break. Um, <laughs> it's very restful. And then you come back ready to roll and jump into clinical year. Uh, so for the clinical year after your break, when you come back for introduction to clinical practice, it's a two-week course uh, where we we essentially call it your um, your boot camp. 
to, to get you ready to go out on rotations. Um, so you will get a review of a lot of the procedures you've already done in your didactic year, things like um, suturing, staples, um, casting and splinting. You'll also get your ACLS certification. And we'll talk to you a little bit about professionalism and how to present yourself on rotation and get you really uh, feeling prepared and confident to go out. After that, you will hit the ground running starting your clinical rotations. So as you can see listed, we have nine rotations, each of which are five weeks in length. We have seven cores, which are listed up here for you. Every single student will do each of those cores, and then you'll have a choice of two elective rotations. And those can be in any area of medicine that you like. We do have a pretty robust selection of electives, things from dermatology to orthopedics to interventional radiology. Um, and if you do have an interest in a specific area that we don't have an elective in, we are always happy to work with you to see if we can find um, a place for you to go to do um, to do a rotation in that specialty if needed. Um, yeah. How are clinical rotations um, selected for the student? Is there a lottery? Um, if there's no lottery, you're not ranked. Um, we don't like a competitive atmosphere for students in general in, in the way you might see in some med schools, for instance. Um, so we actually have you fill out a placement request form um, where we ask you which rotations you're most comfortable in starting with. Um, and we usually do that around March or April before you're about to go out on rotations in June. So you'll have in general a pretty good idea from the past didactic year of what areas you were interested in and based on your backgrounds, what your patient care experience was, what you'll feel most comfortable starting in. Um, and then we'll ask you for your preferences and a few other demographic related questions like if you speak any other languages, um, it might be a good match for some of our rotations where um, they have a wide variety of, of demographic patients. Um, yep. Do you utilize our other campuses from the country for rotations? Or you, you know, at this point we don't. Um, the large majority of our rotations are in Rhode Island, although we are looking to expand that right now. Um, and at this moment are working on agreements with facilities in Florida and Arizona. Um, the large majority are here in Rhode Island though. Um, after every single rotation, you will come back to campus, uh, usually for a day or two. We do give you a test, although there's only, I think, eight tests in the clinical year, not quite 50 <laughs> like there are in the didactic year. Um, the great thing about those tests is that we use um, exams from the Physician Assistant Education Association, which um, are used nationally. So it's a good opportunity for you to compare yourself to PA students uh, across the nation on how you're doing and how you compare. Um, with them at the same stage in their clinical year. Um, and those are also modeled heavily after the boards, uh, another great way to help prepare us um, to have you succeed when you're taking your boards. Uh, the other big component of the clinical year is your master's course, which you can see up there as well. So that also runs throughout the entire clinical year. Um, to give you a brief summary about it, basically you'll work with a faculty advisor um, who you're assigned really when you come in with your didactic year, so you already have a relationship with that person and you develop a question based on um, usually an interesting case or an interesting patient that you've seen out on rotation um, and come up with, a, you actually do a, almost a literature review on that case or that question um, and then also a presentation as well. Anything to add, sir? I'm sorry, anything to add? Not at this time. Okay. Are we doing okay? We come along at a good pace. We're doing good. Uh, let's see. Ah, application. Very exciting stuff. A little bit of data. I love data. Um, so the most recent applicant data I got from CASPA. CASPA is the Centralized Application Service for PAs. What a great website. Full of lovely stuff. Um, but that's the most PA programs in the country are members of CASPA. So when you apply to a PA program, you'll apply through CASPA. Centralized applications are make life a lot easier. Um, CASPA has has members 224 programs now. Um, there are some programs that aren't members of CASPA, but they're becoming smaller and smaller all the time. Um, Applicant data, 27,370 students applied during the 17-18 cycle. 
which is um, up slightly um, from the year before, 1.6%. The most the most recent matriculant data shows that of that 27,000, about 8,800 got accepted. So there's about a 33% pass rate nationally in, in for PA programs. I think it pays to not put all your eggs in one basket. Um, most students, the mean for is, is for a student to apply from, from six to seven. I think the optimal is 10. Anything more than 10 sort of doesn't, doesn't work as well statistically for getting into a program. So there are nationally about three or four applicants for every seat. I know for us, we have 36 seats, the class that, that we're looking at starting um, the interview right now. Um, we have 36 seats. The last class we had close to 1,000 applications for 36 seats. So we have even a larger ratio of, of applicants to uh, particulates than, than most places. Um, the average, average matriculant is getting um, younger, if you look at the data. Um, but the range of the average matriculant is anywhere from 19 to 61. So it's an, it's an incredible rate. I was 44 when I got into Yale, 46 when I graduated. So there's lots of, lots of age groups that are being considered, being considered. Another interesting data that I've looked at, yeah, that I looked at yesterday actually is that there's becoming more diverse, there's be, the, the PA program, the PA applicants and the students who are accepted are becoming more and more diverse, finally. It's, it's happening a little bit. Um, Asian, Black, Afro-American, Hispanic, and multiple um, ethnicities are increasing and students who identify as white is going down one or two percentage, percentages every year. Um, um, students who get into PA programs, the number one undergraduate degree is a biology and then in decreasing order these are these are the other ones um, the matriculant cumulative grade point average the average student nationally of all students of all students that get in 3.57 their science GPA GPA is 3.51 and their non-science GPA is 3.65 big range but that's but that's the mean and we typically we've got some data a little bit later to show you that we're a little bit above that for the mean of students that we that we accept into the program. So it's competitive, and it's, it seems to be getting more competitive all the time. Ooh, here it is. A lot of data, but um, if you look at the last, the, the data from, the Casper gave us from 2016 and 17, the national means, these are the numbers associated with all of our classes so far. Class of 16, 17, 18, 19, and the class that we, class that we just accepted. They're not here today, but they're, they're, they're be coming down in a little, in a little bit. Um, and you can see that our, act, that our means are higher than the national mean typically, but that we have a range. So just because you may not have the mean at a 3.59, we go down to a 3.2 occasionally for, for, a, for a student or, or in, in one of these areas. And I think the one Thing, take home from this that Katie's going to talk a little bit more about in a minute is the numbers of the place to start but we really look at your application take a 360 holistic view of your application it starts with numbers but we look at your letters of recommendation your direct patient care experience um, the numbers that we have as the mean for national for help for direct patient care experience is much higher than our 250 hour um, minimum, but, but again, there's a range there too. Some students may only have two or three hundred hours of, of healthcare experience, but others go up into the tens of thousands because they were captains of fire departments or, or EMTs or paramedics beforehand. So, if you really look at the whole application, don't let these numbers stay, but um, if you look at the whole application. Do you have any numbers on how many students you typically interview? We interviewed less than 100 last year out of 1,000 applications for 36 spots. Um, we look at GRE scores. Um, we like to see them above 50. Um, it's just another one of those things. If your grade point average is a little bit lower and your cumulative grade point average, we maybe look at, we put a little bit more weight on your on your GRE scores because it because it talks about potential for us. Um, so, and a lot of these numbers are on our website as well. Yes, they're all posted. In case you want to review them a little bit later. 
Okay, the application process. Hi everyone, I'm Katie Spalladoro from Admissions. Welcome. Talk about the application process real quick. How many people here have applied through CASPA to date? Okay. Has anybody? Yeah, I'm not surprised. We've had our application cycle open since um, April, and we're actually our edit, our deadline will be in March. So. Some of you may have applied pre previously, and also some of you are probably looking into it right now and our application is open. Um, everybody applying to our program will apply through the centralized application service. Um, we are one of the, in the majority of programs that use that service. Um, what we're looking for in an application. Um, so how many people again filled it out? So you're aware it's about 30 to 40 pages, just depending on, on what you're filling out. It's pretty intense, they ask a lot of questions. Um, all general information about you, we do require three letters of recommendation for our program. GRE scores are mandatory. Um, we don't have any exceptions to that, so no matter if you have a master's degree, it's a, 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 even a higher education degree, we're still going to require those GREs, and that's to make it even for everybody that's applying to our program. We like to keep it fair on the whole playing field. Um, we do look for PA shadowing and also direct patient care hours. 250 hours is our minimum, however, you'll find that on average over 2,000 is traditionally what our matriculated students are bringing in. Um, official transcripts will be submitted through CASPA. If you have any updates, any courses in progress, you can actually go back in through CASPA and update, update those, and sometimes we also will request official transcripts as well at the end. Our deadline is March 1st. However, this program is on rolling admissions, so our application cycle begins in April, and typically we do find that our program is pretty close to full by the time our application nears. So we always would encourage you to apply sooner rather than later. When does Johnson & Wales receive your application? We receive it as soon as you submit it through the CASPA portal. However, it does take them time to verify. So some people will um, submit it, and if you're not already verified through CASPA, it's going to take a couple of weeks for that to happen, and that will slow down your application here. Um, and how do we contact you for interviews? We reach out to the qualified candidates that we'd like to bring in, and we make sure that we're in touch with them for scheduled interview days. Our program requirements, um, a bachelor's degree from an accredited four-year college or university, um, number one. The minimum GPA is a 3.0 that we will consider. However, as you saw from our statistics, we're closer to a 3.5, 3.6 overall, and about a 3.5, but again, that's the average. Um, we do go lower, we look at the whole package. But Dr. Bottomley was speaking to the GRE scores, direct patient care, what you're bringing to us, what kind of fit you are for our program, we look at everything. So. Obviously, we want to make sure that academically you can handle our program, but we're looking at a lot of pieces of the puzzle. We do require the GREs, direct patient care, we talked about that. Shadowing, um, and as far as prerequisites, every PA program is different. It's something that um, we all discuss quite a lot. Our particular program, um, we're looking for a couple of courses in English and math, things that you standard, standardly receive in your undergraduate degree, um, some psychology, some um, biology, eight credits of biology, eight credits of chemistry with labs, Anatomy and physiology, eight credits. Um, the only expiration date would be the anatomy and physiology. Those have to have been completed within the past seven years, so you have to be pretty current with those courses. Direct patient care, this is a question that's going to come up. We're probably going to have a few of them. Um, uh, direct patient care varies. Typically, we like to see the most popular forms of direct patient care are CNAs, EMTs, ER technician, um, medical scribe. can vary across the, com uh, the country. Those are the big ones. Yeah, those are the big ones. I think those are the big ones. Um, every time somebody will come to us, sometimes they have a, a different kind of job title, and we're really looking to see what exactly you're doing in your role. So we're looking to see that you have that hands-on direct patient care contact. So when you're looking at the job opportunities out there and your own direct patient care, that's really what you want to take into consideration, how much contact with the patients you have. Um, make sure you're comfortable interacting with patients and staff. Maturity and presence, that's Dr. Bottomley. So he likes to make sure we bring in somebody that has the seasoning to be put into any kind of situation yeah. and be able to handle yourself professionally. We do run across the spectrum when it comes to applicants and their background levels, their different ages, um, different experiences, and we look for everything. Um, many people will say, do you frown upon a gap year? Is that not considered? competitive enough, and we actually don't frown on that at all. The more experience you have, the more experience with patients, the more life experience, the better you look to us just because you actually have that presence and maturity to handle any kind of situation that you might be thrown into in a clinical setting. 
Our website is pretty complete. Every question you have is pretty much answered on there. We've made sure of it because we kept track of your questions for five years. <laughs> <laughs> so they're on there somewhere. If you have any questions, it's all there. Ooh. And then we're back to Dr. Bottomley. Yeah. He's big on having a plan. You didn't want me to keep this slide, but I, I did. Like, I, I think it's important it's here. It's a good slide. Um, <laughs> so you need a plan. Um, are you academically prepared? And what we have are prerequisites. They're pretty minimum. So I think the more the stronger your foundation is when you come to us from undergraduate school or graduate school, the more success you're going to have here. So don't, so don't just take the anatomy and physiology and psychology, but go on and take a genetics course and an immunology course and a microbiology course. Really, those kinds of things set you up for, 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 for uh, to, to get more out of the program when, when you come here. Um, <clears throat> Also, when you're building your semester schedule, make sure you have a few courses with rigor in there. Don't, you know, you need to take some heavy workloads to demonstrate to us that you can take organic chemistry and physics and microbiology at the same time. I mean, we really look at the rigor of the rigor of the university you attend, and we also look at the rigor of the of the of the course load that you take every semester because you're going to be coming here and we don't want you to be overwhelmed because you've never had to carry such a significant workload for, for your past. So, so just a word, a word to the wise. Are you financially prepared? <clears throat> you know, like I said, look around at the cost of, the, of different programs. Because if you really want to go into pediatrics and you go to a program that's $145,000, you may not be able to afford the pediatric salary when you get out in order to pay your, pay your, pay your tuition and fees. So really look at that carefully. And are you personally prepared? We love gap years. We love, yeah, these are, the, these are our new students. <laughs> Is it the whole class? <laughs> <laughs> We've never had this many students volunteer to come and talk, so. We're just going to be one more minute. We love gap years. You know, I think some of you all have had gap years, and some of you have had this as a second career. Um, and you've really got to, when you come here to have this two-year experience, this is the only time in your life you're going to be able to really devote 24-7 to learning the practice and the art of medicine. So get your ducks in a row before you come here. If there's some sort of responsibility that you have as an elder or a dog or anything that you're taking care of. Children, you need to have a plan for how those things are going to be taken care of because you really need to devote as much time as possible to, to, to your studies here. Jobs, we really, really, really discourage people from having jobs and being in the PA program. We'd rather have you go to the gym or something else to relax rather than thinking that you need to do another shift as, a, as an EMT on, on a weekend. Uh -oh. so, so, so have a plan. This is, this is, this is Dr. Spolodoro's uh, information. And um, I told you to take my number down. Uh, timeline? Yes, so um, as I said, we open our application cycle in April. Um, we are on rolling admissions, so as I said, we will accept your application later, but your best chances are to submit it earlier if possible. We're actually gonna start interviewing. We've already got interviews lined up for yeah. dates in August, September, October. And then we'll be enrolling our next class. Our deadline is in March, but don't wait. And uh, we'll have our next class of 2021, our sixth class starting in June, which as they can all tell you, it was a very long year when they interviewed, but it was by quick, so it happens. Let's, in, let's introduce all these people. Um, <laughs> um, and because you're really here to listen to what they have to say. So we're gonna have to kind of make this quick, but why don't we start with who you are, where you went to undergraduate school, and what kind of healthcare experience you had before you came in. My name is Quinn Lincoln. I'm from Stanford, Connecticut. I went to the University of Scranton, Pennsylvania, and I was a patient care technician on med surge, emergency, and intensive care units. Um, I'm Allie Conrad. I'm from Denver, Colorado. I went to uh, my undergrad at Colorado State University and with a degree in psych. And I did my undergraduate, or my patient care hours as a 
medical assistant and also as an office manager for a period as well. Uh, I'm James Boylan. I'm from Reading, Pennsylvania. I went to York College, Pennsylvania. Um, as a biology major, I did all my patient care hours as an EMT and a medical assistant. I'm Alexandra. I'm from Steubenville, Ohio. So I went to school at Kent State University. Um, I majored in exercise science and the bulk of my hours was a patient care tech in a med surge unit. I'm Kira. I'm from Dillsburg, Pennsylvania. I went to Providence College. I majored in health policy and biology. And I did my patient care as a CNA in like a rehab hospital. I'm Erin Smoka. I'm from Groton, Massachusetts. Um, I went to the University of Rhode Island, right down the road. I studied cell and molecular biology. And I got my patient care hours as a um, EMT and as a nursing assistant on a cardiac floor. I'm Taylor. Um, I'm from Long Island, New York. I went to Quinnipiac University in Connecticut where I got a radiologic science degree. So I was an x-ray tech and MA and that's how I got my hours. My name is Adam Sokolowski. I'm from Southern Connecticut. Went to school also down the road, uh, URI, and I got the bulk of my patient care hours as an EMT. My name is Michaela. I went to Providence College. Um, I'm from Mobile, Massachusetts, and I got my hours as a tech on the med search floor and then in the emergency department. <coughs> my name is Emily Hebel. I'm from Middletown, Rhode Island. I graduated from Providence College and I got my patient care hours as a medical scribe in the emergency department. I'm Jeremy Reed, Phoenix, Arizona. Um, I just retired from the fire department. I was a captain paramedic for 20 years um, in the University of Arizona a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name's Amy. I'm from Rhode Island. I graduated from the University of Connecticut, and I also got my hours in medical school at the University of Connecticut. Hi, I'm Melissa. Um, I'm from Situate, Massachusetts. Also graduated from UConn. And I was a medical assistant in an outpatient office and then also worked at UConn taking vitals at the health center. I'm Juliana. I'm from Everett, Mass. Got my human bio degree at UAlbany and I was a, a ED tech for my hours. My name's Diane. I went to the University of Delaware and I got my patient care hours as a CNA in a nursing home. My name's Sarah. I'm from Cumberland, Rhode Island. I went to the University of New England and I got my patient care hours as an EMT. My name's Meg. I'm from Rhode Island. Um, I went to the University of Connecticut, studied pathology, and I got my hours as an ER tech and an EMT. My name's Hannah. I'm from Winchester, Virginia. I went to the University of Virginia and I studied biology there. Um, I got my hours as an EMT and an ED scribe. I'm Katie. I'm from Situate, Rhode Island. I went to Stony Brook University for undergrad and I got most of my patient care hours as a personal care attendant at a nursing home and as a scribe. I'm Brenna. I'm from Auburn, Maine. I went to First Sinus College in Pennsylvania and I was a CNA and a medical scribe. I'm Kendra. I'm from West Greenwich, Rhode Island. I went to the University of New England up in Biddeford and I worked as a clinical care tech um, for two years on the med search floor. Uh, my name's Zach. I'm from Detroit, Michigan, <laughs> and uh, I got a degree in health science uh, with a concentration in nutrition. I did my work as a CNA on a cardiovascular ICU. Um, my name is Fraser. I'm from Springfield, Mass. I went to UMass Amherst. I did kinesiology, exercise science, and I was an EMT. So, do you have any questions for anybody? They're, you're going to be able to, they're going to, the students are going to give you tours later on, so you can certainly have time to ask them questions during the tour as well. But are there any general questions that a student or a faculty member or anybody can, can answer? Diane, come on down. Let's, let's quick introduction for, for Dr. Sulecki. Tell us a little about yourself, ma'am. Doctor? <laughs> Um, I'm an internist here in Providence, just a couple blocks away. I have a private practice. Uh, it's a rotation. Uh, I am a, a uh, well, I'm not going to say the year. I was going to say the year. <laughs> I, I went to upstate New York, uh, and I have a degree in nursing. And then I did uh, my um, pre-med at Rutgers University uh, because I'm from Jersey. And uh, then my medical school uh, education in Georgetown. Uh, my residency at uh, Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx, then I was National Health Service Corps because what do we have to do? Back. Yeah. <laughs> and it was expensive. So 
So, and I did that in Brooklyn, and then why am I in Rhode Island? I married a Rhode Islander. And that was 26 years ago, so. And I'm very proud to be part of this. Thank you very much. Okay, Can your turn. <laughs> and we'll let anybody, what's your question? Okay. Don't be shy. Yeah, there's one. So you guys are uh, first years, um, just started. Yep. Yep. How many tests so far? Thirteen. Who's counting? Yeah, six weeks, fifty-eight bands. Yeah, fifteen. We have like way too much fun together. I feel like yeah, yeah, I have all these people. Yeah, they sleep over sometimes. Get close really fast. I just want to point out that the day today started at 8 o'clock and we finished at 5 o'clock and they're here because they're volunteering. They've already developed such a camaraderie and a, I think love for the program. You know, they are just, they make us happy to be faculty because they're so motivated and such gracious learners. I'm just overwhelmed that you guys are all here. <laughs> Thank you. We have a question. <laughs> <laughs> Just in terms of like the academic culture of your school, do you guys find it easy to collaborate together to study, or do you find yourselves more on your own? Uh, we're very collaborative. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't speak for everyone. We study like silently on our own, but like all the time we're talking, we're sending yeah. each other study guides. Like we're always talking about. We have a group chat. Yeah. 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 So we're sharing everything that like we find on the internet or make study guides and we share it. There's like never competition. Just everyone posts like all their study guides, so it's like almost overwhelming the amount of study guides. <laughs> <laughs> Any advice for students who are in the audience who are thinking of applying or just why? Any words of wisdom from anybody? If you haven't applied yet, definitely try to get your application in early. As Katie said, it is rolling admission, so if you apply early, you really increase your chances of getting in. I feel like during the whole application cycle, like don't get down on yourself. You're going to hear from schools and you're not going to hear from schools. So always know that it's going to work out and you're going to try your best. So don't get down on yourself. Also, before you apply, make sure that you know you know you're going to need a personal statement, any kind of supplemental essays or a resume. Make sure you have all that kind of completed and done with like an advisor and checked over before the cycle even opens. So that way you know what you have to expect. You have time to fill out everything else and get everything in pretty early. Also, like, don't get discouraged if people tell you not to apply and you're a senior in college. Because I think like six or seven of us graduated in May, came here June 4th. So um, just apply when you want to. Taking a gap year is good too, but a lot of people try to discourage me from applying. And I did anyways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I almost didn't apply and my mom was like, oh, you have to. And I was like, I'm not going to get in. I'll prove it to you. And <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I graduated on Saturday and then I moved back to Massachusetts from Delaware and then that Wednesday I started PA school. So like whatever your schedule is, it's doable. You'll figure it out. But the majority of us majority, sorry, of us did take time off. I'm just, just doing a gap year. Or three. <laughs> 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 during my during my career, that's when I attended school. So I did everything to get into school while I was working full time as a part time. So it's anything's doable. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you guys, I mean, I know you guys are kind of fresh into the program, but have you guys have any experience with the uh, like the anatomy lab yet? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Day one between yeah. the day. Oh. Definitely yeah. first day really awesome. helpful to see everything. I couldn't mm -hmm. imagine not yeah. Yeah. touching and seeing and like looking at everything. It was like a huge selling point for yeah. me for this program. Like, and yeah. Our bodies are um, fresh, new. <laughs> so they're not like not bodies really from another culture. school. Um, so we get, yeah. yeah. And there's they're also students concerns. to one body, so you really get hands-on experience with it. It's not like five, ten people crowding one body. 
Yeah. And it helps more than you could even imagine. Even if we're studying outside of the lab and reading the book, we're like, uh, I don't remember what this looks like, and we just walk right into the lab and look at it on the cadaver. And it really it makes it real. During, and during the week, we're in there like eight hours a week, probably. So just during class time and then more, you know, on our own. You could go in at any time, like me and him, we're, we're, we, go, we go to like midnight sometimes. <laughs> it's a little creepy in there. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to do that. Yeah, you don't have to do that. That's my like 10. Saturday nights, but you got, you got. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm one of those for me. Like this school is this whole building is just ours, and we get to come in whenever. So I don't know why you guys are here so late, but that's what it's <laughs> And you know, no one else is going to be here like, in your, not in your way, but you know what to be like. Now, there was an emphasis on humanistic care in terms of. You know, providing the best care we possibly can for our patients. Now, I'm curious, as far as the professors and any of you students as well can answer this question, how do you guys incorporate those values into classroom lessons? Do you use real world examples, personal experience, whatnot, to discuss this was a moment in time that this patient needed this, and this is how we did this? Yeah, I think, you know, we start off in summer, um, we do cultural competency. So there's an awareness of, you know, the interaction between a provider and a patient that. We may speak different languages or we may speak the same languages but have completely different understandings of the process. And that empathy versus sympathy versus real communication, meaningful communication and partnering and care is instilled very early on in the program. And I think the collaborative nature too, you know, one of our biggest responsibilities as faculty members are advisees. We each have um, six advisees, and we stay with our advisee for two years. We are really invested in them doing well and their experiences over the two-year period. Um, so they see how we sort of take care of each other as faculty, how we take care of them as students, how they take care of each other, and even some days how they take care of us. And there really is a feeling of not just words on the wall, but living our mission statement. It's not just sort of false advertising. We really build a community. And we're lifelong learners. It may sound kind of trite, but 30 years of practice, I learn something every day. And that feeling, like Professor Hughes said, it's not about the grade. We have to ensure minimal competency while always shooting for excellence in outcomes. We're trying to get you in that zone, and some days you're going to be excellent, and some days you're just skimming that bar. But it changes over time and with years of experience. And so that willingness to keep learning, to keep trying to do it a little bit better every day, taking all of our experiences and incorporating that into who we are, and for me at least, paying it forward. I love what I do. It's been a wonderful profession for me. I've supervised 400 PAs. I've hired hundreds of PAs. And this is one of the most humbling jobs. This taking these minds with the souls in the right place, like Dr. Bottomley said, smart and kind. It's simple, but it's so powerful. That's the kind of provider you want. Like Dr. Sidlecki, we we're trying to make people who are smart and kind. We put that together. We move as a unit. It's not the highest grade or the lowest grade. It's did we pass the exam? What do we need to work on? Did we not have a clear question? We spent a lot of time looking at our exams. The quality of the question. Was the question well worded? Was the answer back bank discriminative enough for you to have one best answer? Did it, maybe we had a visiting professor, so you know, one of the faculty that came around and gave a lecture that was slightly left of what our objectives were. So we go back and we teach that aspect. You only take exams on Fridays, and that's intentional. You take your exams on Fridays, and then you've got the weekend to restore that life school balance. See family, make phone calls, go to a movie, run, do something, but cleanse your body, restore. <laughs> and then when you come back on Monday, you didn't take an exam that went into a black hole. On Monday, you start with refresh and review. We pull up that exam, and we go over it with you. Here's what the class did. And then individually, you can come to us privately. We can go over these, but we look at the exams and we give you information. Geez, you know, if more than 60% of the class didn't get something right, we reteach it right then and there. Or we say, you know what? They got the concept, but it wasn't a great question. Oop, we're going to toss that question. 
So there's a constant movement forward as a group. There's a real feeling of, and that's a hard thing, I think, to get over. When you, you know, these are really smart people, and they're coming in here with high GPAs. And, you know, an 82 is horrifying. Like, you know, call mom crying kind of thing. And we're like, 82, excellent, high five. And they're like, it's an 82. <laughs> good, good is not the enemy of perfection. You know, it's, it's you gonna say something? Oh, I was just gonna say, like the very first week, um, we started talking about it. We had a uh, doctor come in, Dr. Boslow, giving it his experiences just in humanistic medicine as it is, and you know, really getting us just to revolve around kind of like what his mentality was and his thought process was, um, which is exactly what the mission of this this program is. And you know, doing projects. I mean, he gave us a project the very first day, as you know, learning about humanistic medicine. So. And to answer your question further, um, when we get into the fall semester, you can ask any of the current second year students, what I like to do is to tie in stories of my own clinical practice and what I've learned and pearls and tips that I've gained over the years and try to incorporate those into the lectures, whether it's you know, clinical medicine or patient care. I just try to tie those in so that it creates a picture in the students' minds of you know, different scenarios. And it could be something that's um, ethics-based or reflects upon humanism and medicine or just practice based. Yeah. Uh, community service is personally very important to me. Um, what opportunities have you guys found or what is available through um, JBU to um, get more involved in the community? We're doing the water, water fire. fire. <laughs> Yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's an event coming up this summer. War Fire is a big thing that happens in downtown Providence with in association with the river and um, turns into sort of a fire. And um, uh, Professor Miller leads a charge along with students from Brown and other places. It's a War Fire event devoted to educating the public about hepatitis C. So that's, that's sort of the first community-based event that they've, got, that they've got coming up. So we, I try to keep the students as kind of their own leaders. Like, and they're very early on, so at this point, it's just like pass anatomy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but we do have several things. We do Night the Light for leukemia, which is a walk. Um, we do the farm to table. Um, they have on Sundays right here in Providence where the farmers come in and our students do blood pressures and education about salt and the diet and things like that. Um, we have multiple things that we've done in the past and each class has its own flavor of what they want to get involved with. So we usually give them a lot of ongoings and opportunities and they decide as a group kind of where their interests are so that type of thing goes on all year long. In a 24-month program, there isn't a lot of downtime. You know, there is, um, like they said, the first day, basically, they were opening and making first incisions on their cadavers. They had a project to do for PHP. It's really a, an accelerator. We try not to <laughs> overload them with stuff right. else, required stuff outside of the classroom, because we really want them to have some, da some downtime to chill. Um, so we balance the community service with other stuff. Um, they cook meals at the Ronald McDonald House, we've donated food products, we do coat drives, we've done food drives, we've done blood drives. I mean, every month there's a community event, um, and we kind of let the students guide that, and just as the faculty liaison, I just kind of make sure it's a, you know, Safe and appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions from the group? Yeah. How many hours of shadow do you have? Do we have a, sh what's the number of, did we create a number of hours for shadowing? No, we don't have a minimum um, number, but we just ask that, one of the reasons for the requirement is to make sure that candidates that are coming into the field really have an idea of what PAs do in, in several fields. So. Some students come to us with, um, you know, under 10 hours, but I would say the majority of them actually have shadowed in a couple of different areas just to get a good feel. A lot of times you'll see they're shadowing a nurse practitioner, maybe a PA, um, sometimes an MD, it all depends, but we do require PA shadowing experience if there is no minimum number. Yes? Can the shadowing experience be paid? So if you're working directly with a PA and you have a 
your healthcare hours? As like a medical scribe, you're working. Typically, we do consider that. Okay. Yeah. That's shadowing. Well, um, well, if they're working alongside a PA, we will consider those hours. Um, See, learn something every day. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I know you guys are still early on, haven't done your clinical rotations or anything yet, but did any of you come in with um, specific specialties or like fields you want to work in in mind that you, I mean, like change obviously, but. I mean, we talked about it in one of our classes recently. Um, Professor Kim Boris was like, how many people want to do this and this? So we all have ideas, but mm -hmm. I'm definitely, and I think everyone else would say we're open to change. So we're excited for clinicals to see what everything's really like. But, and if you didn't come in with something, you One of the activities that we did in previous years, they wanted, they went around the room basically and 36 people wrote down what they thought they were going to end up with. And then two years later on one of the last weeks back on campus, we looked to see how many people ended up going into the field that they thought they were going to go into. Um, the other thing is that community service, depending on what's going on in the world, um, there was the flood, the typhoons, Dr. Bonnelly in Texas, right, and we reached out to a sister program. Several of their students lost everything. Books, couches, stethoscopes, and so we did a fundraiser. We raised money and sent it to the students in a, a program in Texas. Yeah, no, in, in Texas? Texas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Any other hands? Any other questions? Okay, any other final words of wisdom from our first years? Good luck. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, faculty, anything else in closing? Oh, she had a question. Oh, oh, sorry, I just have one more. No, no, that's um, okay. So how, um, can you talk a little bit more about how the food and food is medicine thing is incorporated into the program? Yes, like so, so, like I said, we usually start the didactic year not during the summertime because they probably wouldn't be too pleased with me during anatomy. I said, well, let's go take a few uh, hours off to go cook. So we wait a little bit to the fall, and then once we start those modules, is really when we try to incorporate it. So um, again, I usually, I mean, we all work together, but looking at the didactic schedule, um, I try to look at what modules we're on and then try to pick topics that go along with that. So um, cardiac diets is what we've done in the past, diabetic diets. Um, we've done... Um, like the GI, we've done like gluten-free, celiac, those kinds of things. Um, so going down, we have um, kind of a plan in place. I work with the chefs ahead of time to come up with a, a curriculum. So we come up with a bunch of menus um, for that particular topic. Uh, ahead of time, I'll give the class the menus. Everyone kind of picks groups. So we go down with the game plan kind of ready to go. Um, the chefs give us a little lecture on um, what we're learning about that day on the chef side of things. So your nutrition background, dietetics, um, and actually, you know, using a knife because you'd be surprised. I don't know how some students eat at home, but um, <laughs> there, there's definitely room for improvement in the kitchen with some, with some people. So it's a great, you know, uh, life lesson too, just learning those basic skills of knife cuts, um, how to sear meat, things like that, they go over with us as well. Um, so then we all go into the kitchen and cook together with the chefs, um, and then afterwards we get to eat everything, which is the best part. <laughs> it's very popular, I mean, we volunteer as faculty, it's down at this beautiful Harborside campus, which is on the water, in these world-class kitchens, like Emerald Lagasse kitchens. You know yeah. what I mean? Anybody like, that likes to cook, it is oh my gosh. so fun to you. And they time. play music, they have fun, they throw things, you know, <laughs> and then they eat, you know, it's great. <laughs> Okay, anything else? This is it. Last chance. Okay. How do you want to well, match them up? Our students have all volunteered to give you a tour of the building, so just feel free to.